Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Comes like rats from a sinking ship up here. Everybody bails after they rain. <laughs> I'm alone again. Um... My name's Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Because of the grace of God and the fellowship and steps of AA and sponsorship, I've been sober since June 26, 1988. And um, that's a miracle because 10 days was a long time for somebody like me, and 10 days was a really long time for you if you were anywhere near me when I was doing 10 days. I was a little edgy. And uh, usually by the end of a week, somebody would be saying, why don't you just have a beer, Beth? You know? <laughs> Not really drinking, just beer. Uh, I want to thank the committee for inviting me to speak. Um, it's always an honor and a privilege to be asked to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and the committee's done a great job this weekend. It's been a really nice weekend. And I always want to thank the tapers. Uh, part, I have to... Do full disclosure here, I used to be a taper, so I, they have a special place in my heart. But, you know, I mean, you know, if you've ever told somebody a story and heard it three people down the line that it doesn't resemble what it started in, you know, these guys really carry our history. Uh, they carry our history. And so they perform a valuable service. And, um, and you know, I, I it's already been said this weekend, but Hanging out with a bunch of women on purpose is nothing I ever aspired to do. Uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and they said hang out with the women, I was horrified. I mean, hor- you have got to be kidding me. I, it's bad enough I'm in AA for God's sakes, and now you want me to hang with... Because I, I didn't drink with women. You know, I didn't have to. I could keep up with the men. I... You know, I when I was in high school and, and the you know the girls were drinking, they would giggle and fall down and throw up and wear pink. Um, <laughs> we all like the same guy, you know. It just is complicated drinking with girls, and later it's like. Oh, is that your husband? Oops, sorry, you know. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, so I, I just didn't drink with women because I didn't have to. I had a huge capacity for alcohol from the start, and I could keep up with the men. So that's where I spent my time because men were, they were easy to drink with. You know, they were easy to drink with, and uh, and they provided protection and many other little perks. And, <laughs> so, um, um, so, you know, hanging out with women just wasn't on my list. And, and as you'll hear, there are many things that were not on my list when I got here that have become the biggest blessings in my life. You know, it's, it's you hear it said, if you're new and you make a list of what you want, you will sell yourself so short, you know, and that's so, and I heard that in the first year, I thought, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, because, um, you know, you also heard it like grateful people. I'm, I just, I have to tell you, I'm not one of those people who walked through the doors of AA and the first time through the door went, oh, thank God I'm home. These are my people, you know, <laughs> I mean. I don't know about you, but grateful people just made me kind of want to puke. And, you know, I'm so grateful, and it's a blessing. And it's like, oh, get a life, will you? <laughs> um, so I, I uh, and I knew about AA for a long time. My father joined Alcoholics Anonymous in 1966 when I was seven years old. And, uh, you know, so I grew up with AA in the house. And I grew up knowing that sobriety was, you know, possible, and and uh, and I didn't really grow up with a lot of drinking. I didn't grow up with that chaos. You know what I mean? I didn't. I I'm an only child. Um, there was no fighting there. My mom slammed cupboard doors periodically. It just, you know, there wasn't a lot of drama at our house, uh, which is good because there was plenty up here. But um, I knew about AA. You know, I was the kid in the corner at the Friday night meeting with the coloring book because my parents couldn't always afford a sitter, so I would be. You know, Friday night was an open meeting in Hamilton, Ohio. I grew up in Oxford, Ohio. 
And, uh, you know, I knew AA was all old guys that ate donuts and drank coffee and smoked because I'd seen them. You know, they were all my dad's age. They were 35, 40 years old, you know, (laughs) going to die any day. And uh, (laughs) so I knew about AA. And, And what that did, you know, my dad told me all the drama of his drinking and the tragic losses and the broken dreams and and uh and what that did for me really was when I started to drink I just felt really bad for him <laughs> that he had such a hard time cuz you know I'm thinking dad just drink a little more like me you could have hung in there longer and uh but I never once said out loud I wonder if I'm alcoholic you know I mean that's the one thing that having a sober parent will do for you I've I've heard speakers say oh I used to sit in the bar and go hey I'm alcoholic so what well you know when you got a sober parent you kind of intuitively know that if you utter the A word in the same sentence with your name, wherever you are, a big book's going to drop out of the sky. <laughs> the bartender's going to hand you a meeting schedule, and the AA police are going to come take you away. <laughs> so I never wondered if I was, I did not put that name, I, I didn't put Beth and alcoholic in the same sentence ever, ever, because I, you know, I probably just on some level knew. Um, so I was an only child and I was a big reader as a kid. That was probably my first escape. I would always have my nose in a book. I, the house could fall down around me and I wouldn't notice, you know, I think as near as I can tell, that's why I did well in school was all that early reading, you know, um, to this day, I can't diagram a sentence, but I could proofread anything and, you know, cause I just recognize it. And so, you know, what that did for me is it made school come easily. And, and I, like I said, I think it's from the reading because if it involved work, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have been done. Um, I didn't, I didn't do things that were hard. And, uh, and so school came easy. And so I was the little star, you know, through school. And my first grade, as my husband points out with glee all the time, my first grade report card said Beth has great leadership potential, but she tends to be a bit bossy at times. <laughs> I'd like to think that's gone away, but sadly not. Um, anyway, I, you know, I would not have told you that thinking was my problem when I got here because I drank so much. You know, I had so much drinking to point to. And when the book said alcohol is a symptom, I, you know, I didn't really get that. And the longer I've stayed sober, the more I can see back and see how off things were long before I took a drink, you know. When I got here, I heard about self-centeredness, but I thought that meant selfish and vain. And ask me, I'll tell you, I'm the kindest, loving, giving as person I know, you know. And uh, I thought selfish meant I took the biggest cookie, you know. I thought selfish meant I kept this for myself. And, uh, and when I was 10 years sober, I finally got around to looking selfish up in the dictionary. And I was stunned because what it says is totally consumed with oneself and one's own affairs often to the exclusion of all others. And I went, oh, I'll be darn, you know. (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) Um, Because that was me. I just was so, and I, you know, I had, I always, I was an only child, but we lived next door to a lot of kids always, and I would just absorb into their household because I couldn't, even at a young age, I could not be alone in a room with myself because if I was alone, it was too noisy. I had a lot of people in my head. None of them liked me. They all kept score, you know, and if I was by myself, they would be telling me, nobody likes you. Her mom just makes her play with you. They're probably talking about you now. Actually, I'm sure they're talking about you now, and here's what they're saying, you know, and it was just constant. They saw you fall down playing kickball. You can't ever play kickball again. You know, I just, I thought anything I did followed me forever. If I walked in somewhere in seventh grade and two people leaned their heads together and laughed, I knew they were talking about something I did in third grade. You know, I mean, I took my first geographic cure from between sixth and seventh grade. I'd been in a semi-private school, and I thought if you'd been with the same 26 kids, you'd hate them all, too. You know, we'd all been together. So I went to public school in seventh grade because I just had to get out. And I I didn't know drinking would have just made that better. I probably would have tried it. But I, um, you know, so I had all these people in my head. It was too noisy. And I had these things. That I would never, you know, I like I said, if it was hard, I didn't do it, and uh, and if it looked like I might fail, I would never, I would never try anything new in public, because if I if I failed, you would see me fail, you know, and if I wasn't doing something well by the third try, I just didn't do it. Now I never connected the dots 
that people who were good at things might actually practice. You know, I never put together that the, my friends who could play the piano were the ones that couldn't come play because they had piano lessons. I just didn't, because I would look at some, like, uh, my life was a series of snapshots, and whatever was in the picture, that's how it was. You know what I mean? I gave no thought to how any of it got there. And uh, I have two kids from a first marriage, and they were four and six when I got sober and not in my custody. Um, but the, the four-year-old, we would have told you, would, was going to be here. I mean, she just had a gleam in her eye. And she could lie and not blank. I mean, it. she just, we just, you know, Chuck and I used to say, a lot of people say for college, we are saving for treatment. I mean, we just. <laughs> <laughs> and when she was 11, she started taking this really weird turn on us. And uh, and she uh, she wanted to be on a swim team. A lot of her friends were on a swim team. And so we took her and got her a couple lessons because she hadn't really been in the water much. And she tried out for the team. And the coach came and said, you know, she could be on the team, but she needs to practice down in age group. Okay? So she's 11 years old, and he wants her to practice with the 9-year-olds. That was okay with her. That would not have been okay with me. I would have walked away right then. You know? And I was <laughs> it's so embarrassing. But I was 7 years sober when she was 11. And I was having kind of a hard time being the mom of the 11-year-old who swam with the 9-year-old, you know, because how am I going to look? You know, what's wrong with your kid? <laughs> no problem here. Um, so anyway, she practiced down at age group. She was fine with that. She went to her first swim meet. This was a USS team, so they just run heats and post results. Swim moms will know what I'm talking about. She was 70th out of 72, and she went back the next day, you know. I would have been trying to get my parents to relocate. <laughs> and we told her, okay, Sarah, you didn't win. <laughs> but you have a baseline time now. And in your next race, even if you don't win that one, if you beat your time, you've had a successful race. Now, the whole time I'm telling her this, I'm thinking, chill, yeah, right. You know, I mean, <laughs> my parents told me the same thing when I swam, and I never bought into that. I knew they just had to tell me that to make me feel better, you know. She beat her time, and she was happy. Now, the rest of that story is that three, two years later, she was a state double-A swimmer. You know, we swam all over the Midwest. We swam in the pool where the Olympic trials were held. We swam in Michigan and in Kentucky and Louisville and Lexington, all over the place. And at 11 years old, she had never had a drink, and neither had I. And we reacted so completely different to life that it started to become clear to me well, actually, what I've determined is maybe she doesn't react to life. She just lives life. She just shows up and does what's in front of her. I react. I was like a pinball that just bounced from here to here to here to here. And uh, and so we started kind of keeping an eye on her because this is not really thinking that we recognize, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> and she did stuff like, you know, her first summer job, she saved $500. I, you know, we're like, will you be our sponsor? I mean, we just... <laughs> By the time she was 14 years old, we told her, you know, there's supposed to be one mature person in the house. Congratulations. We're pretty sure it's you. And, uh, but you know what? Watching all of that and seeing all of that told me is that my thinking was off long before I drank. That I was so, you know, the big book says the world and its people dominated us. It says that in the inventory. And I didn't really get that when I got here because I had my own Harley and I drank with very big guys that wore black leather and carried weapons. And, you know, I just, people did not mess with me. I uh, I always have to, to qualify that and say I have never been in a fight, um, largely out of a fear of being humiliated in public. You know, I kind of always knew if I hit you, you would hit me back and it would hurt. And, uh, and I, you know, the other thing is, let's face it, when fights break out, drinks get spilled. And uh, it's a waste of good alcohol. And uh, But I looked like I would fight, so people left me alone. And so this dom you know, I thought physically dominated. You know, I was never in violent relationships or any of that. So, And what I've come to understand is what dominated me, the world and its people dominated me, was what you thought of me. The whole time I'm saying, I don't care what you think. I am just driven by who do I have to be to fit in? Who do I have to be to get what I want? Who was I yesterday in case I run into you today? 
You know, what do I have to do? I, I spent my whole life trying to arrange your perception of me so that I could be comfortable. Because my self-esteem had nothing to do with what I thought of me. And it had everything to do with what I thought you thought of me. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't, I never was comfortable in my space in the world. I had to do huge things to justify being this big. You know, Clancy talks about the, that we have to be treated special to feel average. And, you know, and so I had to act huge to feel like I, like I justified my space. And I always had to be Beth, you know, Beth the cheerleader, Beth the night auditor, Beth Jim and Sally's daughter, Beth something. Because so, I felt like if I said, hi, my name's Beth, that you were just waiting for the rest. You know, like being Beth was just not enough. And, uh, and conversationally, I was equally challenged. You know, when I walk into a big room full of people, it separates into two groups, all of them and me. And, uh, you know, you guys all know each other and you all talk to each other. And I don't know what to say after my name's Beth, you know. I just, I don't have a clue. And uh, and so I would go somewhere and I'd say, you know, hi, my name's Beth. And she might say, hi, my name's Janie. And... <sighs> <laughs> You know, I know it's my turn to talk. I know I should be saying something. Now everybody in my head knows I should be saying something. They start up, you know, say something. You're just staring at her. Don't talk now. You look stupid. You'll look dumber if you talk. If you say something, it'll be dumb. What are you going to say anyway? Go big red? I mean, you know. So I'm standing there paralyzed. They're all arguing. We have to go. can't go back there again <laughs> and I thought I wasn't self-centered <laughs> so uh, anyway because of all of this because of being unable to sit alone and, and all of that stuff I was I was driven I mean I was in every club my picture was in a junior high yearbook like 14 different clubs and stuff I just I was busy 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 and uh, and as a freshman in high school, I took a drink. And some of my friends were experimenting with alcohol. They were falling down, throwing up, looking bad. I did not want any part of that. So the first time I got drunk, I just kind of put a little glow on. You know, it was just, it was enough. It was enough that I took my best friend out the next night to get her drunk so that I have somebody to drink with, you know, because I knew I was on to something. And, uh, and our friendship didn't make it another year after that because we drank different from the start. You know, from the start, we drank different. If I could have gotten it every day in high school, I would have been a daily drinker. I was as close as you could get for being 15 and 16 years old. I loved alcohol. I never had a big issue with morning drinking because, you know, when you're skipping school, you have to sober up before your parents get home. So, I mean, morning drinking made sense to me. And then when I was older, I just thought, well, if you could drink in the morning, why wouldn't you? You know what I mean? I mean, my day just went better with a drink. I, my happiest memories were those days where I could just drink all day. Um and so I, I started drinking. I, I graduated from high school barely, you know, um, probably because my freshman year I didn't drink, so I had a bunch of credits stacked up. My friends changed. My grades plunged. I mean, everything on that al -Anon list of is your kid doing this, I was doing it all, you know, but I think my dad was kind of getting ready to drink. So that, for whatever reason, I just kind of slid through unnoticed. And, and I did that a lot. I was always that kid who, you know, you know that guy in the cartoon that's walking down the sidewalk and the pianos and the safes are just kind of crashing behind him? That was always me, just wandering through. And, you know, I mean, I talked yesterday morning about getting suspended from school, you know, and, and it ended up not being on my record because there was no school that day because of snow. I mean, that kind of goofy stuff happened to me all the time, and it made my mother nuts. You know, she had this goofy idea that there should be consequences for your actions. <laughs> I just never bought into that theory. <laughs> but, you know, I... uh I just, I was doing everything, you know, in high school, I was already, it had changed my life. And all of those activities went away one at a time, you know, one at a time. Either I gave them away, take it, I don't care, you know, or it was taken away like the cheerleading, or it just slid away and I didn't even notice because alcoholism is cunning and baffling and powerful. And gradually over the 14 years that I drank, everything that got between me and drinking had to go. And before the end, that included my children, that included my integrity. You know, uh, I'm a child of the 70s. I did many outside issues over the years. Um, but even those, as they interfered with my drinking, they had to go to, you know, because I just, 
as I got into my 20s, you know, I just, I couldn't smoke dope and drink. If I was a smoke dope person, took drank two beers, I couldn't move. And you can't drink if you can't move, so forget that, you know. I just, the only thing I ever kind of get wistful about was the diet pills. It's the only time in my life I ever could drink a lot. I was skinny and my house was clean. <laughs> But by the time I was 25, after two days of that, I hated me and nobody else was talking to me. So they had to go too. You know, I just couldn't integrity, honor, my word being worth anything. Those were long gone. You know, uh, any kind of self-respect, long gone. I, uh, it's funny. We, uh, you know, sometimes we get here and we go, well, thank God I didn't do that. You know, and uh, and when I got here, I, I kind of reviewed and and I thought because I passed through a couple times, but I, when I got here in eight, if if I from here on out, if I say when I got here, I'm talking about 1988. But but I went through this period where I thought, well, thank God I at least avoided prostitution. You know, I I didn't have to go there. And uh, and then a couple years down the road, I'm hearing a fist step of someone who did turn to prostitution, and I heard the amount of money she was making. <laughs> And I went home and called my sponsor, and I said, you know, this whole time I've been patting myself on the back for not doing that, this girl was making $175 an hour, and I was giving it away for a beer. <laughs> Our attitude and outlook on life will change, you know. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Oh, yeah. What's your name? Buy me a beer. God. <laughs> I uh, I went off to college briefly because I grew up in a college town, Oxford, Ohio. And I have to tell you that Ohio, living in Ohio, was my first resentment. I I did not want to. I didn't want to be from Ohio. From the time I was old enough to know there were other places besides Ohio, I wanted to live anywhere but there as long as it was south, where I knew it was warmer. I remember looking at a map in first grade of the United States and seeing California and Texas and Florida. And Ohio, you know, <laughs> and just thinking you could look at a map and tell nothing is happening in Ohio. <laughs> and uh, I tried to get my parents to move. They wouldn't, you know. So I take off to college doing no research. Um, you'd think out of my passion to get out of the Midwest, I would have gone farther away to school than Indiana, but no. <laughs> And I was a 17-year-old freshman and a, geographically in the middle of a 21 state, you know. So I didn't do a whole lot of drinking in college. And I went in with 96 percentile ACT and SAT scores, you know. Um, and, and I had a point eight at the end of my first semester. And I wasn't drinking much. But you know what? I go to class and it's all of them and me. And I go to class and I think, I am going to talk to somebody today. And I'd sit down and I'd say, hi, Angela. My name's Beth, and she'd say, hi, Beth, and <laughs> can't go back there again. You know, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I, you know, making friends was foreign to me. I always had one friend at a time as a child, one friend, more of a hostage, you know, and she couldn't, you can't talk to my friend. Don't talk to my friend because she will undoubtedly like you better, and she will go with you and be your friend, and I'll have to find another friend. You know, I never could let anybody, if you asked me to go somewhere, it did not matter what my commitment was, I went with you. I was always with you because I kind of knew if you went without me ever, you might go, you know, I'm really having a better time since Beth isn't here. And you might say, well, yeah, I thought she was your friend. No, I don't like her. I thought she was your friend, you know. And so I just couldn't, you know, I just, I couldn't let you do anything without me because you would realize that you could do it without me. You know, uh, and that transferred into my work early on. And then I discovered that when you are indispensable, you never get a day off. So I got over that in a hurry. Um, but I, uh, you know, so I, I flunked out of school because I just could, I couldn't get a class. I just couldn't get a grip on how to communicate with people. You know, I just I couldn't do it. And I would not have told you that my life was full of fear. You know, I would not have told you my life was fear driven. The only reason my first inventory had fear in it. It's because the one in the book had fear, 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 fear. And I thought, well, if they have fear on every single one, then I probably have it on mine. You know, so I'll write it down. But I didn't have a clue 
that fear drove my life. Fear of what you thought. Fear of what you were going to find out. Fear of where am I going to get this? How am I going to get this? I was driven by all of it. I had a friend who said, let's move to Florida. We should go to Florida. And I said, we should. You know, I had always wanted to run away from home. Um, we just took off, told no one we were going. When I got down there, we moved to Bonita Springs, Florida in 1978. Uh, I-75 didn't even go down there. The whole town had three traffic lights, a dog track, two convenience stores, you know. And uh, and I got a job in one of those convenience stores because I had worked in one in Ohio, so I had experience. And, you know, what I didn't realize was it was so transient down there that if you came to work three days in a row, you were management material. So <laughs> by the time I called my mom and told her where I was, you know, just don't worry, I'm assistant manager at this store. And uh, and she said what she always said, which is how could you do something this stupid and land on your feet? It just made her nuts, you know. And she said... <laughs> Why didn't you tell us you were leaving? Now I'm thinking, die, ran away from home. That would have kind of defeated the purpose, you know. I said, so I told her I didn't want you to stop me. And she just, you know, that sigh of that mother of silence, you know. She's like, Beth, you're 19. You could have just left. And I was like, who knew that, you know. So I'm a 19-year-old runaway. Um, <laughs> Teen alcoholic mind. <laughs> and I spent six years in Florida, you know, and uh, because I always knew it would be better somewhere else. And, and, and what they were referring to last night was when I was new in AA, I heard a guy say they should just put a sign at the state line of Florida, California, and uh, Arizona that says this state doesn't work either. <laughs> and we could just turn around and, you know, go back where we came from. Um, Bonita Springs is where I found my people, you know. I mean, the whole town was three miles long, and they bought beer on this end of town to drink on the way to the bar on this end of town. <laughs> those are my people. And I moved from there to the Keys. You know, those are really my people down there. <laughs> you know, where else can you walk into a bar and order double rum and Coke to go and take it to the grocery with you? I love the Keys. <laughs> but first, you know, I had this convenience job in uh, in in Bonita Springs, and my alcoholism caught up fast with me there because there were no checks on my drinking, you know, I was free to do what I wanted. By the end of eight or nine months, it was a little town back then, and I had run out of places to work, I had run out of guys to date, Now I briefly referenced dating yesterday. Um, I have to tell you, when I drank, I wasn't, I told you I wasn't a fighter, you know, I wasn't a crying drunk, you know, I wasn't a fighting drunk, I wasn't a falling down drunk most of the time, I had a huge capacity for alcohol. I think that I was the social drinker, you know, because the more I drank, the more social I got. And I was very social by last call. <laughs> but that was dating, you know. <laughs> if they're still there two days later, it's a relationship. <laughs> and, you know, I had a couple principles that I lived by, and one was that it wasn't all right not to know. You know, I can't let you that I don't know what's going on. I can't let you in that I, you know, I can't ask a question because then you'll know I don't know. So, uh, you know, fake it till you make it was not a foreign concept to me when I got here. And the other thing was never, ever, 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 ever admit that you have made a mistake. Don't let on if you were wrong, you know. Now, one of those two, you know, one night stands dragged into a five-year marriage based on that one. And, uh, you know, I mean, I knew I knew three weeks in and we were doomed. But, you know, I'm not going to say I made a mistake. Maybe he'll maybe he'll see the light and leave, you know. But so we ended up married five years and uh, and we had the two kids in that marriage. And, you know, I wanted out for a long time, but I can't leave because then it would be my fault. The marriage is over. You know, I have to wait till you throw me out so it can be your fault. And that's the game I played. You know, I always play that game of let me make it your job to see that we get done what we need to do. I did it to teachers. I did it to sponsors early in AA. They don't play, by the way. You know, uh, they don't play right anyway. Um, and I just, you know, so I'm in this marriage. I don't even like the guy. You know, it was just, it was, it wasn't violent, but it was just stupid. I mean, that's the only word I can think of. We just... You know, and is he alcoholic or not? I have my suspicions. You know, um, it was real easy to look good next to me. That's all I'll say. I don't know how he'd stack up against somebody normal. And uh, and we had these two kids, and we're in the Keys, and, and I, I was home there, I'll tell you. Um, I, uh, again, fell into this great job. And it was the same kind of a move. You know, we went down there 4th of July weekend in 1982. We liked it. 
We came home Tuesday and moved Friday with a six-month-old baby and 400 bucks. Hey, Mom, we moved to the Keys. Don't worry, I'm assistant manager at this restaurant, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I ended up, it was a big resort in the Upper Keys, and I ended up being the night auditor there, you know, because they, they fired the girl that was there. And I, I went and talked to the boss and said, well, I can't start for three weeks because I'm going to Ohio, and I've never done it before. Oh, and the baby needs to come to work with me, but you guys have cribs here, so that should be okay. And I still think he hired me just because he couldn't believe anybody had the, you know, <laughs> could look him in the eye and say all that with a straight face. But I ended up being the night auditor at this resort, and I didn't I didn't even know what it paid. I didn't know what a night auditor did, but I got there for my first night of work, and uh, they gave me the key. Now, this, this place had seven bars and three restaurants, right? So my pay has just doubled, and then they gave me the keys to every bar on the property. You know, it's like... That was a great job. I mean, every oh, everybody who worked there was alcoholic. The security guards were all bikers. I, it just was a wonderful, wonderful place to work. <laughs> and I went to my first AA meeting in the Keys because one day I went to happy hour at work, and I was still there at 11 when I was supposed to clock in, and they were not real amused by that, and I got fired. And I kind of knew even then that I probably wasn't going to find another job exactly like that anywhere else. And uh, so in 1983, I went to the Tuesday night Key Largo group of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I was 24 years old. And they were nice. You know, it was a little circle of people. And it was a discussion meeting. And they all related to each other. And when it was over, they invited me to Perkins. And, you know, I'm 24 years old. I ride Harleys. Thank you. Um, it's 930 at night. And they have invited me to Perkins. My life is over. <laughs> But I went to my boss and told him I knew I had a problem. I was going to AA, and, and uh, they gave me my job back, you know, because the girl they put up from weekends didn't want to work full-time, and everybody hated her. So one AA meeting, I get my job back. I think I went to the Friday night Key Largo meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and told him I got my job back, and that was it for me and AA and the Keys. Um, but I called my dad and told him I'd been to a meeting because I, you know, it's the first time I ever said I was an alcoholic out loud. So uh, in the in the you know in the midst of my three day AA career, I made a mistake of calling my dad, and uh, and within a week I got a box from him and it had a <laughs> big book, twelve and twelve, tape of his talk, each day a new beginning, twenty four hours a day, one day at a time, a few pamphlets, a couple of bookmarks, you know, they weren't really doing T-shirts back then. <laughs> I never know how long he'd been throwing it all in there, but by God, when he got the word, it was in the mail. <laughs> I ended up getting divorced, and, and uh, well, I finally got him to throw me out, which is what I was after, and, and I called Mom, and I really wanted to relocate in South Florida, and she really did not want that, and uh, since she had the money, I ended up back in Ohio. And she had moved to Cincinnati. So in 1984, I got to Cincinnati, and I just, I thought, okay, okay, I should probably go to AA, you know. Uh, I really thought if I just quit drinking with bikers that my life would smooth out, but I'll try this AA thing again. And so I went, you know, and, and Young People's was huge in Cincinnati in the mid-'80s. I mean, there was a meeting on Monday night. Monday night, Young People's had 300 people, two and 300 people. And there was a, a Friday Night Live was 150 people. Icky Paw had just been in Cincinnati the year before. They were on fire there, you know. But when I walk in, it's all of you and it's me. And you're all talking to each other and you all know each other. And you're probably all talking about that big book stuff. And I don't know about you, but when I went through treatment and they say, you know, this is the text for living and the directions are in here. I had opened up to page one because I figured if they really wanted you to read the Roman numerals, they would have made that page one. So I would go to page one, you know, looking for the directions, the text for living, you know, and, and it'd be like... War fever ran high in the New England town. I'm like, yeah, this is real helpful, you know. So I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it, you know. I, I could walk into a bar alone and be fine, you know. I could walk into a bar and know who I needed to know at the end of the night. If I had five dollars, it was on, you know, because I shot, I did not shoot pool good for a girl. I just shot pool good, period. So if I had five bucks, it was enough for a beer and to get some quarters on the table. And at the end of the night, I knew who I needed to know. I knew who shot pool as well as me, who drank as much as me, and who knew where the party was after. And I preferred to go by myself. I hung out with a couple girls, but all of us always came in our own car. You know, and bar drinkers will understand this, because you never know when true love is going to strike. <laughs> Got to be ready to go. And... uh 
can't be messing around giving her a ride home first. And, uh, <laughs> by 1985, I, uh, I was arrested for child endangerment. My kids were one and three, and, um, and they were asleep, and I had nothing to drink. And there was a bar down at the end of my street. And so I knew, I figured they'd be fine, and I walked down there uh, for a drink, you know, and kept drinking. And the police called me there because my son woke up and he couldn't find me. And he came outside and there was a step down, you know, onto the porch so he couldn't reach the handle to get back in. And he cried and the neighbor heard him and he called the police. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where I was. You know, my car was parked right in front of the house. So they called the bar and said, would you like to come home? And Not really. Um, you know, but I, I went and I was arrested for child endangerment. And they said, you know, is there anybody that can come get your children? And I certainly didn't want to tell them about my mother because I would never hear the end of that. And so I said, no, I don't think there is. I guess thinking they go, oh, never mind. We'll just leave now, you know. Uh, and they said, well, then we'll have to call 241 Kids. And I went, oh, wait, I think my mother lives here, you know. So <laughs> so my mom got that call in the middle of the night that no mom wants to get, you know. Come get your grandchildren. Your daughter's under arrest. And, you know, one of the things I forget to say sometimes, but one of the things that I am eternally grateful for is that my mom sleeps at night. You know, my mom doesn't have to go to bed wondering if tonight's the night the phone's going to ring. And what a blessing that is, you know. Um, that whole deal about I'm not hurting anybody but me, what a crock that is. You know, what a crock. My parents never knew what was going to happen. And... uh so it was suggested to me I might want to go to treatment to stay out of jail, and I thought that sounded like a fine idea. I didn't do my research very well. I didn't have money, you know, so I had to go where I could afford, and it was all women. It was six weeks long. It was a nightmare. And, uh, it, but I was the one, you know, because I got this test taker brain, you know. I can read anything, spit it back on a test, and not know what I read two days later, which is perfect for treatment. You know what I mean? Perfect. It does not work in AA, however. And uh, But in treatment, I was a star. And in the mid-'80s, it wasn't that common to have a sober parent. So I have a tape of my dad's talk. I already have my own big book when I get there. I have underlined everything that you might think is important in case you want to see what I'm reading. You know, um, I'm the one that they come get to talk to women who didn't want to leave their children for six weeks to go to treatment. And I could tell them all the right things. I had all the right words. It's better better six weeks now than forever later. And if we're not sober, we can't be moms, you know. But there was a problem with that. And the problem is right in the book, you know. The book talks about a double life, the one we want people to see and the one we know is true. And the problem for me, the double life that was forming up in me, was I was relieved that my mom had my kids. I was glad they were gone. I did not want them back. I knew I was probably going to drink again. Actually, I kind of was looking forward to drinking again. I just would prefer to drink and not go to jail. But I didn't I didn't want my kids back. It's hard being a single mom, you know? It is hard with a I had a second floor apartment. It's cold in Ohio in the winter. If you got to go, that's why I'd walk down to the bar and when there was nothing to drink. You know, which kid do you put in the icy cold car while it warms up? You know, which kid do you leave alone up there while you buckle the other one in? I had moved from South Florida to Ohio, and I'll tell you what, in 1982 and 84, babies were disappearing out of cars in South Florida. You don't leave your kids in the car to run in and buy beer, because when you come out, your kids might be gone. Now, that wasn't the case in Cincinnati, but I was from South Florida. And it was just too hard. My kids, at my mother's house, those children had dinner every night, age-appropriate food. They got a bath every night. She read them a story every night. They got to daycare on time and clean clothes. I couldn't do any of that. I hated her for doing it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I made her life miserable at every turn, you know, because it was her fault. Um, again, she did nothing to earn that. That was just my view on life. It had to be somebody's fault. It wasn't mine. And, uh, and so, you know, I have this double life form and I don't want my kids, you know, but I want you to think I want my kids. If you ask me, I said, of course I want my children back, you know, but, but the, the, I just couldn't do it and I knew I couldn't do it, but you just can't tell people that, you know, and, and, uh, and it's not something I like to trot out there now, but I'll tell you what, I, sometimes we come in here and life gets good and we get so good that it's hard to tell we drank. And I don't ever want a new girl to leave here thinking I don't fit here either because I am too bad. I didn't even want my kids. You know, I need you to know that alcoholism emptied me out. I had nothing to give them emotionally, spiritually, mentally, 
you know, what my kids heard from me over and over and over was, I love you, go away. You know, they would talk to me and I'd be looking right through them because I'd be thinking, you know, and I wouldn't have told you I was a thinker, but I was so far in my head. How am I going to get it? What am I going to do? What did I do last night? Who do I call? What do I have to do? That I would just go, "Uh uh uh-huh, 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 and look right through them. And my children slowly became invisible in their own house, you know. Um, I love you, go away. And what a horrible thing to do to a kid, but I had nothing to give them. So for the next couple of years while I was in treatment, you know, now I have plans I'm going to go be sober with my dad at 405 Oak Street in Cincinnati because my dad's sober again by now. And uh, and I got word in the treatment center. It was a place where you couldn't have any contact with the outside world for two weeks. And the 10th day I was in there, I found out my dad had died suddenly, they called me. And I was pissed, you know, because I'm going to be sober with dad. I'm going to go be Jim's daughter. I don't know how to be Beth. And, uh, you know, that's shot. Well, I'm the only child of divorced parents. So I get all of the uh, insurance money. And for the next two and a half years, I got to drink the way I wanted to drink, you know. And the kids stayed at my mom's. And every now and then I might sober up for a day or two, you know. And uh, But I'll tell you, when you stop drinking with no solution, a lot of guilt can creep in in 24 hours. And I might have had a good day, but by the end of the day, my head would be almost to the pillow and they would all start. Yeah, Beth, but you don't even want your own kids. What's the matter with you? Tell that to your friends and see how they react. And so I just, you know, and when I got sober, I thought, why, you know, if I was that miserable the last two years I drank, why didn't I just get sober? I mean, it's knowing what to do and doing it are not the same thing. You know, I always cringe a little when people say, I know what I have to do. I'm like, you know, don't tell me, show me. Because I, uh, you know, I knew what I had to do. I thought, why didn't I just get sober if I was that miserable? And then again, I heard it from somebody else. I went to a lot of speaker meetings when I was new and God would always send me what I needed to hear. And this guy said, you know, when I drank, I knew I was probably going to be miserable. But I knew if I didn't drink, I was sure to be miserable. And there was at least a shot that I was going to have a good time if I picked up a drink. And I thought, that's it. You know, the only hope I had was in that bottle. That was it. And uh, and at the end of uh, end of 87, I was just kind of tired and hit a wall and, and just said, God, I can't live like this anymore. You know, I was living... I had said for a long time I lost my my uh, apartment and, and you know, because the money was gone, and, and I moved into a friend's attic apartment. And um, about a year and a half ago, I realized it wasn't an attic apartment. It was an attic. Um, <laughs> it wasn't an apartment until I lived there. And, uh, you know, I just, life was gray. I mean, I would wake up and not know if it was day or night. You know, it would be 530 and. I didn't know if it was a.m. or p.m. and didn't really care, except that I couldn't bear the thought of getting up to the bar and finding out it was 6 in the morning because I didn't have enough money to drink all day. And I would go back to sleep and think, when I wake up, it'll be light or dark. And I would, you know, toss and turn and wake up, and it'd be 5.45, and it would be gray, you know. And I was 28 years old living like that. And uh, and I so I just said, God, I can't live like this anymore. I just cried and cried. And I remembered this big book my dad had sent to me, you know. All the, I never threw it away. It was a hard. I can't throw away a hardcover book. I don't. If you're new, don't buy a paperback. Get a hardcover book. And uh, and I read Bill's story again because I always start on page one, you know. And uh, but that night I identified with Bill Wilson. It's the first night I ever got past the fact that he's some old stockbroker and saw the alcoholic and saw how he felt. And I identified and I slept with the big book that night. And, You know, I just felt relieved in the morning. I felt better than I had felt in a long time. Um, However, I didn't do another thing about staying sober, you know. Now, I believe, and there are those who might debate me on this, but I believe God removed my obsession to drink, okay. But I didn't do anything after I surrendered to stay surrendered. And that was the story of my life. I can look back and see every time I ever asked God for help, he was there every time. But there's a line in Bill's story where he says he realizes that when he had needed and wanted God, God had been there, but then God was blotted out by worldly clamor. You know, and I never really thought about what's a worldly clamor, you know, and I saw that a few years ago and was like, oh, that worldly clamor, you know, him, them, the job, the money, what, you know, whatever, whatever the it of the day was, it was more important to me than God. And, uh, And so I did end up drinking on and off in early 88, but things just changed there, you know, things changed. And uh, 
in June of 1988, I had this brilliant flash that everybody in Florida was going, God, I wish Beth would come back. And uh, <laughs> so I lifted Mom's credit card, and because uh, I, you know, I don't have any money, and Mom's credit card and I went off to Florida on a one-way ticket. And uh, I got down to the Keys, and of course, nobody was real thrilled to see me. I had left under kind of a questionable arrest, and because uh, we had a well, we had, you know, it's really expensive living in the Keys, so we just had a little part-time business going because, it's you know, everybody needs two jobs down there. And uh, and I just, I remember telling the probation officer that I just thought of it as a part-time job and seeing her eyes kind of glaze over because they called it sale of a controlled substance. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the first trouble I got in I thought I might not get out of, you know. Um, but anyway, so I... Uh, I went to Florida, and on June 26, 1988, I knew I had to come back to Ohio, and I, I had gone from the Keys over to Benita to see a couple friends. And I was at the Fort Myers Airport on June 26, 1988, and I didn't have enough money for even one drink, you know. And if I'd had enough money for one, I could have got two. But I couldn't go sit in the airport bar and wait for somebody to buy me the first one because I couldn't bear the thought of being asked to leave because we don't want your kind here. And I thought about just lifting a purse off a little old lady, you know, because um, I might get lucky and she'd have cash, but I had one of those hangovers, and I knew the way my luck ran, I would pick on the little old lady that did aerobics twice a week. And <laughs> she'd run me down, take her purse back, and I would look oh so bad. And uh, so I called my mom, you know, what do you do? Call mommy, and uh, told her where I was and that I wanted to come home. And she said, I don't know, call me later. And when I called her back, uh, she'd been on the phone with those Al Anon people, and. Uh, <laughs> She uh, she said, I booked you a plane ticket, but you need to know that I'm not flying you home. I'm flying the children's mother home, and it's only because we're afraid we will never see you again if we don't. And she picked me up at the airport, and I had not had a drink all day, you know. If I'd known that was my sobriety date, I'm sure I would have tried harder to get a drink on the plane. I just didn't have a clue. And when she picked me up, she dumped me off at the local detox center at, like, 1 in the morning. And I was not amused, you know, uh, and she just said, go in or don't, but you can't come home with me. I've done everything I can do for you. You're going to have to do it yourself. And thank God she did that because I told you my favorite game is let me make it your job to see that I get my work done. And I wanted to make it, you know, it's the first time I ever was really accountable for my own recovery. There was no friendly direction left. I had nowhere else to turn. And, uh, you know, it's a family disease. My dad had one brother who's like 30 years sober now, and his daughter, who's a year older than me, he, uh, she lets me tell this story, but uh, on May of 89, out in California, he pulled up to a phone booth with her and handed her a roll of quarters and said, I hope you use one of these to call someone that can help you get out. And uh, and she's been sober ever since, you know. Um, we just don't get sober when there's a friendly direction left, you know. Um so anyway, I go in this detox, and I'm laying there that next morning kind of mulling over my options, which, you know, I had none. And uh, and I, I always thought I'd be dead. You know what I mean? I never planned to live. I, I just never expected to see 30, you know? I mean, I rode motorcycles drunk. I drove drunk. I mixed drugs and alcohol. I bartended in places where people shot at each other. I hung out with large men in black leather with weapons. You know, I should not have been, I should have been dead over and over and over and over and over. And I realized laying in that detox bed that I was 29 and a half years old and I was distressingly healthy. There wasn't a thing wrong with me. My blood pressure was low. I mean, I just, there was nothing wrong with me. And I realized, it's like this voice came down and said, people like you don't die, Beth. <laughs> I knew I was going to live. And I knew I was going to live whether I drank or not. And I knew no matter how bad it was that it could get so much worse. That at 29 and a half, I still had most of my teeth. I still had all my fingers and toes. All my limbs worked, you know. And I knew people that that was not the case. And I knew I could be them. One of the reasons I never tried to kill myself is I knew I would live. I knew I would live and probably be maimed and look bad. And, you know, I just knew I would live. And that day I thought, I can't do this for another 40 years. I can't do it. I mean, I was a wino in my 20s. I love Wild Irish Rose, you know. I had the white wine. I had a little class. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, panic to me was jumping in the car with a bottle of wine on the way to work and ripping off the plastic and discovering there's a cork in it instead of a screw top. It's like I carried a corkscrew in my car after that to avoid situations like that. But, you know, Wild Irish Rose, I always say Wild Irish Rose is good because the bottle's square. 
so it doesn't roll out from under the car seat. Um, very handy. Good, good to know. Um, anyway, you know, I just had this thought like, God, you know, whatever. I mean, I didn't have a place to live. My car was impounded. I had charges pending. These were not new things. But I just had this passing thought of, you know, whatever those AA people were doing seems to be working for them. And clearly what you're doing is not working for you. Perhaps you should just do it their way. Now, I didn't know. I always thought if I surrendered, it would be in a blaze of glory. You know what I mean? Down in flames, biker, street warrior, you know, whatever. Um, and what I have found is when I surrender, it's just this one pitiful little voice that just looks around, surveys the situation, and goes, oh, screw it, you know. And that's it. I'm surrendered. And I had no idea that was a surrender that was going to save my life. But I went to alcoholics. I was in detox five days. I got out, and I made a commitment. I was going to maybe go in a halfway house. wasn't sure, but I couldn't get in for a month. So I made a commitment. I knew if I went where I drank, where I lived, I would drink. I knew if I went to Norwood, I would drink. So I got. I, I made arrangements to go in this hotel for women. That should have been a sign of a surrender right there. And but I couldn't get in till Tuesday because I got out of detox on Friday at Fourth of July weekend. So I scraped up a little bit of money and got a cheap hotel that was right on the bus line because I couldn't get my car and I couldn't get in this place till Tuesday and I knew I would drink in Norwood. And I almost didn't go to a meeting the first night because I thought, well, I've been going for five days. I could take a day off. You know, but this voice in my head said, you skip meetings and you drank. Okay, so I, I came out. I got on the bus. I wrote it down. It was just one bus to the AA clubhouse. I could cope with that. And I went in, and there was this woman speaking who was four years sober, and I had met her four years before when I passed through. And uh, and she told a room full of people that alcoholism took her to the place where she didn't want to work. She didn't want to take care of her daughter. She just wanted to drink. And I couldn't believe that she was telling a room full of people she didn't want to take care of her daughter. Because that was my big secret. That was the one I was taking my grave was that I didn't want my kids. And my biggest fear when I got sober was would I even know how to love them? Would I be able to love them? I didn't know if alcoholism had just robbed me of the capacity to be, even be able to love them. I am all about me. You know, today my first thought still most of the time is, yes, but what about me? You know, I am just not an intuitive parent. I don't think of other people first, you know. Uh, and I started showing up at AA, and I got this woman's number, and I called her the next day, and it took me half an hour to call her because... Everybody up here, nobody wanted to call her, you know. She, she just being nice. She didn't really want you to call her, you know. What if she says Beth who? My biggest fear. And uh, but I finally called her and I said, "This is Beth." And I just want, you know, I'm I don't know what to say. I'm just practicing using the phone. And she laughed and said, "That's what I had to do." And so, you know, I tell newcomers, call me. You know, if we give you your number, we want you to call. People who don't want you to call won't give you their number. Or they'll write it down the wrong one. <laughs> Just call and say, I'm practicing. Because, you know, we're not going to have deep philosophical conversations when you're four days sober. It's just not going to happen. And remember that if you call me, I'm 19 years sober, and I still have no more idea to say after my name, Beth. You know, I don't know what to say now any more than I ever did. So... Tell me you're practicing. I'll tell you good, you know. Uh, we might figure out where you're going to a meeting. But I practiced using a phone because that voice said you didn't call people and you drank. And for the first 30 days, I pretty much did the opposite of whatever my first instinct was because, you know, I had done, like, all the wrong stuff. I stood up. I said I was new, you know. I went early because they told me sit in front. That was a challenge, you know. And, and at 405 Oak Street, you had to get there at 7 o'clock for the 830 meeting to get into the third row. You know, it was just one of those kind of places. And miracle after miracle after miracle started happening just because I was there. You know, my sponsor says you must be present to win. And uh, and because I showed up, things started to happen. I went back the next night on Saturday night. Now, I don't, you know, if you sit in front, you have to talk to people. But if you sit in back, we know you're new. You know, and I still didn't really want to be new. So I came in the second night, and I sat in the second row over against the wall. So, you know, I was kind of participating, but still less people to have to talk to. I got a wall here. Well, that turned out to also mean that when it was time to say the Lord's Prayer, there's no hand to hold over here. There's a wall. And everybody in my head starts in. What a loser. No hand to hold. Everybody sees you. You know, you can't even say the Lord's Prayer right. And I just hung my head and hooked my thumb in my pocket. Alone, you know, loser. And uh, 
and somebody in front of me turned around and took my hand. And, you know, I was so relieved. I had no idea. You know, I just started to cry. I cried all the way through the Lord's Prayer, almost the end, and I had to, like, stop, you know, so you couldn't tell. And, uh, but it's like, I, to this day, don't know who it was that did that, but they're the reason I came back the next day. That's what got me in the door the next day, was somebody taking a minute to be sure I wasn't alone behind them. And, you know, that's 12-step work, too. We talk about 12-step work like it's rescuing people out of detox. But remember, the newcomer's name is 12-step work. God, I just wanted you to know who I was. But I didn't even know that's what I wanted. How could I ask for it? I didn't think I needed anybody. You know, Cindy referred to it a little last night. My, my, you know, my view when I got here was like, I don't need you. I don't like you. Why aren't you talking to me? You know? <laughs> or as a friend of mine says, help me. <laughs> I didn't even know that's what I wanted. I didn't know I wanted you to know my name. I didn't know. I, and when people started saying, hi, Beth, what a relief that was. And when you sit in front, you get asked to read, and then more people know your name. And, and they told me things like, thank the speaker, thank the chairperson, which I thought was kind of stupid, but I do it to this day, because for all I know, that's what's been keeping. And they don't thank the chair people in North Carolina, so they look at me weird still. I've been there five years. I figure they'll get used to it one of these days. But, you know, because that's what I was taught to do. And, and what it was, it was one more time there was human contact. You know, there is spiritual energy when you touch each other. Sometimes, I don't know, when you're new, somebody walks by and just puts their hand on your shoulder, and for a minute it's going to be okay. And we can't lose that. You know, we can't lose that. And uh, and I started showing up, and I went to this big book meeting because, um, well, I'll talk about it in a minute, but I was going to this new big book meeting, and when I was out of detox a week, my um, they passed a basket at the Friday night meeting. A member of that group's nine-year-old daughter had been killed that day by a drunk driver. And uh, so the next Tuesday, he was at that big book meeting that I was going to, and I couldn't believe he was there. And he talked about how it happened in Cincinnati. If you got a DUI, you had to do three days to keep the court happy, and you did it somewhere called Drake Hospital. And Drake Hospital was sat on Galbraith Road, which was a two-lane road, and these cars were drag racing on Galbraith Road in front of Drake Hospital. Hit the car she was in head-on. She was killed instantly. And those people that were doing their court-ordered weekend were outside when it happened. And he said, maybe one of them will get sober, and maybe it wasn't for nothing. And when I left that day, I was thinking, what if I had been in that car? What would my kids be left with as a memory of their mother? You know, or what if they had been in the car? What would their last thought of me have been? You know, and uh, and I realized, it's like I, the trees got greener and the sky got bluer. And it was one of those moments that in hindsight, I recognized that God came. And I just said, you know, I have a chance. I could go call my kids right now and tell them I love them with no strings attached. Because there was always a string with me, you know, and a broken promise. And it's like, I could just go call and tell them I love them. And I have this gift of a second chance. And I remember hearing gifts go by in my head and thinking, where did that come from? Because gift was not a word I ever put with AA in the same sentence. But it was like, I can call. And the other thing was, I could start from right where I was, because I always wanted to do it. Well, what I wanted was a magic erase board, you know. <laughs> Just forget all that stuff. And and that I could start with them from where I was that day at ground zero and build a relationship with them from there, you know. And that I may be a weekend mom for the rest of my life. I might never have custody of them again. And if that was the deal, that was okay. And I could be a good weekend mom, and I could get them when I was supposed to. You know, and I called him and I told him I loved him. And I began to make amends to my children by not making promises that I couldn't keep. You know, I was very careful to make one promise and keep it and make one promise and keep it. And I started showing up at meetings. And this big book meeting I was telling you about, there was a big book meeting at noon. I didn't go to learn all about the big book. I went because I had three reasons, all good ones. One, you're supposed to read your big book every day. I figured this should count. I won't have to read at home. <laughs> Two, meetings over at 1 o'clock. I got my whole day free. And three, they read the entire chapter, which chewed up half of the meeting. So chances were better I wouldn't get called on to talk. Of course, I know now I wouldn't have gotten called on to talk anyway, but I didn't know it then. So, you know, God's got a sense of humor. And what happened, because I was in that big book meeting, was, one, my day was free at 1 o'clock, but at 4.30 I would remember I had no life. And so I would go to another meeting, you know. Two, when I, when you read the book, I hear it, you know. I would try to read at home sometimes, but I would either be like 20 minutes later on the same page, you know, or else I'd be 20 pages in and have no idea what I read, 
Or I would go, all right, just one pair. I'm just going to read one paragraph and remember, 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 you know. And I would read it and read it and read it and close the book and it would be gone. You know, I just couldn't. My brain was sawdust. And I didn't do a whole lot better with you guys. You know, when you were reading half the time, it was like, rarely have we seen a person fail who is thoroughly, I wonder what it's going to cost to get my car out of impound today. You know, I'm... War fever ran high in Winchester Cathedral. That guy has really good looking. I wonder if he's got a girlfriend. You know? I just couldn't stay on the page. But I was more on the page when you read. And, uh, and a funny thing happened. You know, it started sinking in. And, and I knew it did because I was, I don't know, I was two or three weeks sober and running an errand after the noon meeting. And I popped in to see what we were all talking about up there because they're all up there still. I just don't go there very often. And, uh, but I popped up to see what we were talking about. And somebody in my head is going, that was really cool what Guy said in the meeting today. And somebody else is going, yeah, I didn't know that was in the book. Did you? And somebody, oh, I didn't know that was in the book. And I remember thinking, God, the voices in my head are getting sober, you know. <laughs> hey, this is good. <laughs> this is good. My sponsor said appoint a sober chairperson and get out of there. So... Uh, <laughs> I try to let the sober voice be in charge most of the time. Every now and then the petulant child grabs the gavel, but uh, most of the time the sober person's in charge now. So anyway, and the biggest joke on me was that people who go to big book meetings on purpose and do what it says tend to read, or go to big book meetings on purpose, tend to read the book and do what it says. And out of laziness, I had plopped myself into the middle of the most active people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they just sucked me in. I was doing two meetings a day. They had me answer on phones at intergroup. When I was three weeks sober, they said, Beth, why don't you write an inventory? You've been around before. And I thought, okay. I mean, I didn't know I could plead like I'm not ready. You know, I mean, the book says real clearly, if you have decided you want what we have and are ready and are willing to go to any lengths, you are ready to take certain steps. And I think I was just finally willing to go to any length. So I was ready to take certain steps. And they said, write an inventory. And I said, okay. So I wrote it, you know. And that woman who had talked the first night out of detox became my first sponsor. And, uh, you know, and I just, my life took off. I have never looked back. You know, I thank God I didn't have somebody who thought I needed to work a step a month or a step a year. I could not have gone three or four or five months without writing an inventory. I would have blown my brains out or yours. Um <laughs> So anyway, I uh, I started showing up, you know, and I brought my kids to meetings on weekends, not because I wanted them really to participate in recovery, but because I knew I'd kill them if they didn't come with me, and because I, I could not go to a meeting all weekend. But, you know, a strange thing started happening when I brought my kids. You know, I learned how to be sober here watching you, but I've learned how to parent here. I've learned how to be married here. I've learned how to be employed here. You know, they told me, watch the winners and do what they do. And when I brought my children to meetings with me, you guys didn't glare at them because they were noisy. You sat down and you talked to them so you could look them in the eye. You called them by name. You asked them to help you get coffee. You colored with them. You played Game Boy with them. You know, you made them feel a part of. And their gaze came up off the ground, and they began to look the world in the eye, and they became less invisible. And it's something I was bad at for a while, and I try to remember now, if somebody walks in with their child, to sit down and talk to them eye to eye and call them by name. You know, because my children became comfortable in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was handy because Sarah remembered everybody's name, which was really helpful because I could not. You know? <laughs> so somebody would be talking, and I'd be going, what's their name, what's their name? And, and, and uh, you know, to myself, like, God, they just said their name. I can't believe I can't remember. You know, and Sarah would go, Mom, when she's done, can I say thanks, Cindy? I'd be like, Cindy, that's it. You know, you, <laughs> sure, honey, go ahead, you know. <laughs> But my kids became involved with me in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they became a part of because you guys talked to them. And watching you, I learned how to talk to them, you know, and, and things sort of happened. We went to an eating meeting when they were, uh, I was about a year sober. We went to a big picnic thing, and and uh, when we got there, there were kids playing, and I said, hey, you want to go play? Because I always said that, go play if you want, and they never went and played. They always hung out with me, and that was okay. But that day, I wasn't paying much attention. About half an hour later, I felt a tug on my leg, and my son Robbie was seven, and he said, Mom, I just wanted to let you know that if you need us, we're over here playing. And every now and then, God picks up the curtain, and I see what's going on, and I realize that they knew they could let me out of their sight, and I'd be there when they got back. And that took a year. You know, I'm so glad I didn't make them go play. You know, and things just kept happening. By 15 months, I had my license, insurance and a car all at the same time. 
I never could manage more than two out of three, you know. And by Thanksgiving of 89, I was coming up on a year and a half sober, and they do a big Thanksgiving dinner at 405 Oak Street at 1 o'clock on Thanksgiving Day. And we went for that. We went at noon, you know, because that's what I do. I go to Noon Big Book. And, uh, and you know, by now I'm looking because I have a little job. I have a little apartment. You know, one of the things my mom and I talked about when I was a year sober was that the kids probably should stay with her. You know, they had been there. By the time I was a year sober, they'd been there four years. She was in a good neighborhood. They had a great school district. They'd had the same friends for four years. I was in a 10th floor efficiency in the Cincinnati Public School District in a crappy section of town. What greater good is served by dragging them down to my level in the name of family unity? You know, they were in a good place. So we, we determined that I was to catch up with them because they were doing what they were supposed to do. I was the disruption in their life, you know. So, but they spent more and more time with me on weekends and holidays, and, and so now I got the little job, the little car, you know, little kids hanging out with me, and, and a little apartment, and I'm looking at my son, who's seven and a half, and I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of women in his life. I mean, my mom, his sister, me, and a little guy like that needs a man in his life. <laughs> I should probably start looking around for his sake, you know, because that's the kind of loving, giving mom I am. So we go to this Thanksgiving thing, and I go to Noon Big Book, and when I come out, I can't find Robbie. And somebody said, oh, look across the street. Well, there was a schoolyard across the street. used to be. It's gone now. And there's Robbie and another 7-year-old boy and four of the guys from Oak Street playing football. You know, And I thought, where else should a 7-year-old boy be on Thanksgiving Day except playing football with a bunch of guys? But the curtain picked up a little farther, and I realized that I did nothing to make that happen except go to my noon meeting. You know? And it's a a message that got through to me that if I did what I needed to do, their needs would be met too. I don't need, I talked a little yesterday about, you know, when I'm playing God, it's because I've reappointed myself in charge of results, you know, and that if I just do the footwork, God's results are usually way better than mine. So I called off the manhunt and, um, (laughs) briefly, uh, as it turned out, Chuck and I started a date about a month later. Now we had met each other a year before I, uh, he, but I had when I was a year and a half sober, he came and spoke at Oak Street. He he had a year, and uh, and I had never seen him before because I, you know, I mean, I took most of my bar skills except for the dating, <laughs> all my other bar skills to the clubhouse. I mean, I knew everybody, and so this guy, they had this all group gratitude thing where different groups from around town would come talk on Monday night and bring one of their members to speak. And apparently his sponsor had told him, you have to stay out here in the suburbs to get sober because if you go to Oak Street, you'll just find a girl, fall in love, and you'll be gone. So he came in at a year sober and talked. And I'm thinking, oh, how sober can this guy be? You know, I don't even know him. But he was a year sober. He gave this tremendous talk. Those of you who have heard him talk, you know, he gives an amazing, amazing talk. And I always tease him that at that moment I thought to myself, you know, I want what he has, and I am willing to go to any lengths to get it. (laughs) But really, we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't start dating for another year. We crossed paths periodically, but about a year later, we started hanging out. And and he had dated like I dated, you know. And and we just decided that's not what we want to do. You know, we know how to do that. We want to date. And so we kept our clothes on, and we got to know each other, and we fell in love, you know. And uh, and he's an active member of AA. He has a sponsor, you know. I have a I forgot to mention by the way, my grat my uh, home group is a gratitude study group in Raleigh, North Carolina. And if you're ever there, please stop by. We're there on Monday and Thursday nights. I live in Cary, uh, but my home group's in Raleigh. I live in Cary because I moved from Ohio, and when I got there, they told me Cary actually stands for Containment Area for Relocated Yankees. So <laughs> that's why I'm there. And, uh, and and I do have a sponsor. Her name's Peggy Martin. She lives in Bellevue, Nebraska, and uh, she's an amazing woman. And uh, and she has a sponsor and she has a home group, you know, and, and my husband has a sponsor. My husband has a home group. And we anyway, we dated. We fell in love. You know, he asked me to marry him and, and we set the date a year away. And as that year passed, we wanted more and more to be married. You know, we didn't go through that breakup. You know, we just didn't have that drama, you know, because we determined at the very beginning of the relationship that I never want to be first in his life ever. And he doesn't want to be first in mine, you know, because there's only one first and God has to be there. And that we would have God and then AA and then each other. So on a good day, I have God and then AA and Chuck is third. You know, most of the time he's fourth because I'm thinking about me. But, uh, 
<laughs> on good days, he's third. And, uh, and that has worked for us. You know, we, and, and it's funny, we didn't realize how much we had internalized that, but when our, when our son was having some problems, bad, we had a bad couple of years. Um, you know, when it first all blew to pieces, we, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do and we went, wait, well, let's pray, you know, and then we'll figure out what to do. And we prayed and we sat down to figure out what to do and we went, let's call Dick and Peg. <laughs> and then we'll, and, and so what, you know, what we realized, of course, in hindsight, you never know what was going on is what we had done, even in that crisis was ordered our lives, God, AA, then each other, you know, and I'm convinced that's how we got through it because we just, it was just not a good couple of years. But we did, you know, we did get the kids back. Uh, we got custody of the children in 1993. We moved into their neighborhood, and they moved in with us. Uh, the year before that, a couple of years before that, we caught up into a little suburb next to them, you know, and they would come a lot of weekends. And, and uh, I guess I have to tell the Huffy stories, and Cindy <laughs> referred to it last night. We uh, we got them bicycles and uh, for Christmas one year. And, of course, you can't ride them until March or April up there, but... We go out on the first warm day to ride bikes, and we got bikes, too, because they were pretty small, you know, and so we're out riding in the suburbs. You might have gleaned by now I'm not especially suburban, and um, <laughs> we're riding our bikes, dad, mom, big brother, little sister, riding in the suburbs on our bikes, you know, and some guys out mowing his grass because they do that there, and and uh, any waves, you know, they wave out there, too. I, you know, where we had been living, if you waved your hands, you know, there were guns. Um, <laughs> guy waves, we wave back, and about the time I waved, I got kind of a look at where I was. You ever do that? Where, like, the Zoom camera looks, like, look where you are. It's like, oh, my God. I used to own my own Harley Davidson, and I'm riding through the suburbs on a lavender huffy. (laughs) How did this happen? (laughs) But the amazing thing about that minute is right then, right there, there is nowhere I wanted to be but on that bike with those kids. And what a miracle, you know, that's light years away from not even knowing if I'd be able to love them, you know, because God changes hearts here. I do the footwork, God changes my heart. You know, the whole time I was out there, all I wanted to be was a child of God, and I didn't have a clue that's what I wanted. You know, I didn't know when I got here I wanted to be one of many. I didn't know when I got here that my strength would be in identifying with you. You know, and through AA and just continuing to show up and continuing to be active and continuing to be sponsored, you know, I have taken my place in the world as one of many, you know, as just being Beth. And I have become a daughter and I have become a wife and I become an employee and I become a mother, you know, and recently I have become a grandmother. You know, and I mean, the kids came back in 93, and we thought, good, at least, you know, I'll get the second half of their lives. I forgot they turn into teenagers. And, oh. <laughs> you know, and we had a couple of really, really, really bad years with our son. There was a point at which I didn't know if we would ever all be able to sit in the same room as a family again. You know, um, but God's bigger than all of us. And, and within a couple of years after that, you know, our family was restored. And uh, and when my son got out of the Army, we moved to North Carolina uh, in December of '02. And my son was, my daughter was in the army already, and my son was getting ready to go in. And uh, and when he got out of the army, he moved to Raleigh to be near us. You know, this kid that we never thought we'd ever all talk to each other again. And my daughter's still in the army. She's in uh, Fort Hood, Texas, in Killeen. And my granddaughter was born on Fourth of July on an army base. So we're trying to resist the urge to buy everything red, white, and blue. You know, <laughs> luckily I like pink now, so she's getting lots of cute little pink stuff. But uh, I always thought if I ever open a retail store for baby clothes, I'm just going to name it the Grandma Trap. You know, because that's what they all are. <laughs> Anyway, you know, my life is so amazing today and all of this stuff. I mean, when I got here, if I'd made a list, what was on it was like, I want my license back. You know, I really would like to not go to jail anymore. Um, certainly riding a lavender huffy around the suburbs wouldn't have been on it. Uh, but the last few years, Chuck and I spent a lot of time going, man, this was not on my list. You know, this was not on my list. We we had decided when we were new... Uh, first married that we would learn to play golf together after the kids were gone because we knew we'd like it and we wouldn't have time while they were all doing soccer and swimming and everything and uh so we end up you know learning we get to north carolina golf mecca and we realized that pinehurst is only 60 miles away and the u.s open is coming so we thought oh yeah let's go what the heck you know we didn't think we'd get tickets but we did so we're down there a thursday and we're sitting in the grandstands on the 18th green at pinehurst number two 
you know, watching the golfers put in, going, all of a sudden we looked at each other like, <laughs> we're on the 18th green of Piner's number two. How the hell do you get here from the do drop in, you know? I mean, <laughs> wasn't on my list, you know? And, uh, I mean, we've been parasailing in the Keys. We were thinner that year, but, you know, I... <laughs> We get to do these amazing things and travel and meet people. And, and, and over the next couple months, he and I are actually traveling together to talk, which is always nice, instead of waving goodbye at the airport as we go our opposite directions. So, uh, you know, I never dreamed I'd have a partner in life that, that you know, had the, that God would be first. And that because God is in first, everything else falls into order under it. You know, if you're new, you know, I wish you desperation. Because as long as I had one other plan on what to do with my life, I was unwilling to surrender to all of this. And if you've been here for a while, you know, please remember that the trick is stay in surrender. You know, Harry Tebow says, never underestimate the power of the ego to regenerate itself. And I can get so well that I can judge myself right out of AA. Um, I'm so glad if you're new that you're hanging out with women. You know, you've, many of you probably got dragged here by your sponsors. Be sure to thank her on your way home. <laughs> and I hope to see all of you again as we trudge together. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.